I guess this is for four thirty. Um, yeah. Hi, so hi, um, I'm Walt. This is talk was on remedial math for programmers. Um, so I don't know. I've given this talk a few times. Um, if you have questions, um, yes. Is that better? Is this better? Good. Good. Um, Great. So if you have questions, um, either ask during the talk or I'll try to leave some time at the end. Um, some some trigger warnings before I get started. Um, one, there, there's a lot of math in this talk. Um, some people say, I was told there would be no math. You were told there will be math in this. Um, in fact, like, like on pretty much every slide, there's going to be math. Um, um, probably a lot of it is going to be review. Hopefully some of it won't be review. Um, so um, keep that in mind. Um, Warning, there's going to be a little Python. Actually, at some point, there was more Python. I ripped some of it out yesterday. Um, I think there's like two slides that have Python in them left, and with reasons, and we'll get to them um, when I get to the slides. Um, I have this, like, well, actually thing, um, because I'm kind of intentionally simplifying things. I'm trying to cover a lot of stuff in, like, 50 minutes. So, um, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably leave some stuff out. Um, so. So who am I? Um, so very quickly, I worked um, in IT for close to 20 years, most of which at a um, major online uh, or, or cable home shopping station. Um, at some point, maybe like a little less than 20 years ago at this point, I decided to go back to grad school, become an ivory tower computer scientist. And then I worked in startup for a little bit, and um, now I'm back as an ivory tower computer scientist again, um, working um, at a, um, a cancer research lab in the radiology department at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so when I started grad school, um, a friend of mine who was further ahead um, in a different department, I was in computer science, he was in electrical and computer engineering, said this friend of his is about to defend his PhD, like the, fall, the end of the week, he said, you have to go. You're going to be doing this yourself at some, at some point. You should go and um, see what it's all about. So this guy was doing his talk on uh, power systems management. Um, and so the first couple of slides, they were okay. Um, this is like maybe slide number three. <laughs> um, and... I mean, honestly, it wasn't this bad. I, I looked up what his dissertation was, and this, I think, was the equation that was on, that was on the slide. That's bad enough. It's got, it's a, it's a Jacobian, and like there's, there's angle, there's thetas there because it's like power systems are, they're signs, and so you have to know what, what phase it is. I, I don't know what's involved in this, to be perfectly honest. Um, um, so then I quickly learned as I started taking classes and, you know, other things that, uh, electrical engineering is not really like computer science. Um, electrical engineering, um, lots of things are analog, like AC, AC um, circuits and things. Um, the power grid in particular is AC. Um, they continue sine waves. Um, but in computer science, like everything is pretty much discrete. I mean, sometimes we'll use, I say no calculus. That's not entirely true. Sometimes we'll use calculus to kind of model things, but things always end up being discrete afterwards. Um, so I didn't have to... While I didn't have to brush up on what a Jacobian was, I did have to brush up on some other stuff. And so this is, I think, what I want to focus on for the talk is like some of the stuff I had to relearn, learn better than I had, um, even though I was a math major and it, as an undergrad. Um, so um, this is kind of what we're going we're gonna to cover. Um, and I think all of this, even if you're not really doing computer science-y stuff, I think some of the stuff I want to touch on is still hopefully useful. Some of you will find some of it to be useful in your, your everyday programming. Um, so let's start with um, exponents and logarithms. Um, so what are they good for? I mean, they're good for lots of things. The thing I want to focus on are um, analyzing algorithms, doing multiplication really fast, and then of course, you can't talk about um, exponents and logarithms without talking about slide rules. Um, at least I can't. So, and we all know how exponents work, right? So, um, x to the n means that you're going to multiply x by itself n times. Um, you want to multiply two things that are exponents. You add that have exponents. You add the exponents. So, x to the m times x to the n equals x to the m plus n. Um, and so, this is an example with real numbers with ten. Right. We all know this, right? It's just review. Um, 10 squared times 10 to the third equals 10 to the fifth, right? Okay. Um, if we divide exponents in the, I'm sorry, the font's getting a little bit smaller here. Um, 
If we divide them, then we subtract the exponents instead of adding the exponents. And that's what's going on here. Um, this is why ten, anything to the zero power equals one. It's because you're basically dividing it by itself. Um, um, of course, the, the exponents can be negative. If that's the case, then you get things that are like one tenth or um, you know one to the hundredth and so on. Um, the exponents, of course, don't have to be real positive or they don't have to be integers. Um, if it's a fraction, they're kind of like square roots or cube roots or things like that, and that's what's going on here. All right. This is all review, right? Hopefully. Uh, so logarithms are the kind of things that maybe people, some people have forgotten what they are. They're the inverse of exponents. So if x to the y equals z, then the log base x of z equals y. So it's just doing the exact opposite. If you have z and you knew that you started with x, what power would you have to raise x to to get z? And that's what's going on here. Um, so if 10 squared equals 100, then the log base 10 of 100 equals 2. It's just the inverse of that. OK? Um, does it have to be 10, of course? Um, 2 to the fourth power equals 16, and the log base 2 of 16 equals 4. Um, uh, so if you know, 2 to the 64th power, so that's what you can fit inside a 64-bit um, integer, is that big number 18, um, that I write it down, quintillion, um, then the log base 2 of, of that number is, is 64. OK? Everyone on the same page so far? Good. Um, so keep that big number in mind because we'll getting we'll be getting back to that in a second. Um, so there are some shorthands. Um, lots of times, like because log base ten is is usually the thing that's most common in lots of math, that just gets called log. So it's, you can leave off the exponent if it's log base ten. Um, the log base e of something that happens a lot in math and in calculus. Um, that's called the natural log, um, and that's ln. I had a textbook that, because in computer science, you end up taking log base 2 all the time. They use LG for log base 2. Um, and there's this great identity um, that if you have the log base, so you might not, not have a, a, a way to compute the log base of anything. It's usually either 10 or most likely it's going to be E. Um, so. The, um, if you want to convert bases of logs, so we want to know what the log base g of x is, you can do that by um, taking the log base k of, or where k can be anything, of x over the log base k of b. So what does that mean? Um, if you want to compute the log base 2 of something, and you don't have a way to compute the log base 2, but you do have a way to do, do natural logs, you can, or any logs, you can take the log base 10 of x over 2, log of 2, or the natural log of x over the natural log of 2. Um, so, right, you, so you can always convert from one base to another, and most log functions that you'll find in programs use log base e. Does anyone know why e is always is the one that's most common? Abigail probably knows. Or do you know? Why? Because he eats everything. <laughs> he eats everything. Um, so that's an interesting theory. Um, um, There's a whole song about it. <laughs> <laughs> it has to do with the derivative of e uh, to e to the power x, uh, dx itself. Yeah, it's, it's like the Taylor series expansion uses uses e. And then like it's the easiest thing to, is to compute. Um, all right, um, so you can do arithmetic with logs, um, which is really cool. Um, so if you, want to take, if you want to take the log base something of x times y, that's the log base x of x plus the log base um, b of y. So that means if, if you want to multiply two numbers together, you can take the log of each of the individual numbers, add them, and then, and then undo the log and then you get the you can get the, the product that way. Um, if you want to take the, the log base b of something that you're dividing, you subtract the logarithms. Um, uh, and then if you want to if you want have want to take something that's an exponent, the log of x to the y is y times the log of x. So why would you want to do this? Um, well, um, suppose you want to take the log of one, two, three, four times five, six, seven, eight. So you can compute the log of 1, 2, 3, 4, and the log of 5, 6, 7, 8 
Um, you get those numbers, three point something and three point something. You add them up, you get six to the 8.45, point, six point, six to six point eight four five. And if you take 10 to that number, you get something that's, what? What if you see those numbers, right? And it's actually pretty close. It's only um, about 1% off. So why would you want to do this, right? Because we've got computers, we don't really have to do this, except um, this is the way, you know, for most of human existence, we didn't have computers, but we did have tables of logarithms that we could look up. And in fact, that's how slide rules worked. Slide rules you would you would use to, um, you would look up those numbers on a slide rule or on a, on a table, and then you get them and you can convert back to it. And if you, like, maybe you want to do it for something that's only four digits, but they were bigger than that, it's faster to look up the logarithms. You know, if you don't have a computer, it's faster to use logarithms, do the addition, and then look up what that, that should be and do the inverse of it. Um, and like I said, that's how, log that's how slide rules worked. Uh, slide rules are kind of cool, even though they're a bit obsolete. Um, this is a great picture. Um, a friend of mine pointed me to. Um, has anyone read this? You can find it online. Um, this book um, was, believe it or not, was nominated for a Hugo Award. Um, it lost in 1960 to Starship Troopers. Um, and it is kind of amazing. Um, um, yeah, it tells, uh, yeah, the Pirates of Zan tells the story of Bran Hodden, a one-time engineer who sets out on a career of interstellar piracy ostensibly to further more legitimate goals. Uh, yeah, he's got a side roll. Um, anyway, um, I love Project Euler. It's got these really cool math problems that you try to solve with computers. Um, one of them was it wanted to know whether that first number, which is like a six digit number raised to another six digit number is greater than some other six digit number raised to a six digit number. Um, which of those is bigger? Um, and like, you can compute that all out, but there, and each of those are gonna be millions of digits and it's gonna take your computer forever. But if you take the log of both of them and we use those um, 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 identities that I showed you in the previous slide, you can work that all out. Um, and you know, if the log of the left is greater than the log of what's on the right, then the big exponent, the exponentiation on the left is gonna be bigger than the exponentiation on the right. And it's super fast to compute this way. Um, and um, was that true? I th I'm wondering if I have an extra digit, but I'm guessing that it must not be true because the one on the left is um, 3 million and the one on the right is, um, I think I must have an extra digit in there somewhere because I think that was, was true. Um, but I think it should only be 2970. Oh, anyway, you get the idea, even if I, if I maybe screwed up in what I, what I typed down here. Um, does everyone follow what's going on here? Um, more or less, right? If you tried to do that, that problem just on a computer without using logarithms, even so, like computers are fast, but doing the logarithm is gonna be a hell of a lot faster than trying to do it because you're, it's gonna blow up, you're gonna blow up what you can store in a 64 um, bit integer. You're gonna to have to do it with big int or something like that. And it's gonna be much, much, much slower. You still have, you have to have the chart that says the log of 62, 3, 2, is No, you don't have to do that because you, you just call the log function in your computer, use your computer to oh, compute the log function. No, we're not using that now. So I'm, I think, I'm sorry, I've gone back to the world of computers now. We've left the world of carrying slide rules around in our teeth. Um, and we've gone back to real computers. I, I'm sorry about that. Um, okay, well, another example of, of logarithms. Um, so suppose you want to, now we're going into algorithms land. Um, suppose you want to find the word GNU in this list. Um, and because it's not sorted, the only way we can find it is to look for every single element. So we have to look for hen and cat and like, is it there, is it there, is it there, is there, no. So you have to go, basically have to look for anything. So worst case, you wanna find anything in that list, you're gonna have to look through everything to find it. Um, but if we sort it, then we can say, okay, I'm gonna start at the middle. I'm gonna look at dog. Is it is GNU greater than or less than dog? It's greater. So I'm gonna look between five and eight then. Um, so I'm gonna look at fox. And is GNU greater than or equal to Fox? Well, it's still greater. So now I'm gonna go be in between six and eight. I'm gonna look at seven. And that's where GNU is. So the reason this comes in here is that, so okay, so obviously we've, so we're doing a binary search here. Obviously it's a lot faster because we can, we, every time we're cutting it in half. And this is still the worst case if things are sorted, but the worst case here is only three instead of, instead of eight. And that's because 
where the worst case is what the x is here, and the x is like what's like two to the three. We have eight. So the worst case of that is going to be solving for x in this equation, and that's basically the log base two of eight. Um, so this all kind of feeds into the idea of what big O notation is. And you could spend like half a course in algorithms learning what this is, but a very quick review of this. Um, big O of one, that means, so these are all going to be um, relative time. So if you double the size of your input, what effect is that going to have on your lookup time? So if you have array lookup, it's always going to be constant time because you can jump exactly to the way it is. So whether you have 100 items or 1,000 items or a million items, you always can jump exactly to that memory location where it is. Um, um, binary search, as we just saw, that's big O of log n. So if you double the, the space, you're only going to increase the runtime by log of it, whatever n is. So, um, so it's kind of still... It's almost constant time, but it gets a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger each time. Um, if you want to look through the entire array, it's big O of n because if you double the size of array, if we go from 8 to 16, we're going to double the runtime of the program. Um, sorting, most sort, sort out really quick sort, for instance, or n log n. We won't go into why that is. Um, um, there's other sorting algorithms or n squared because you have to go through. Um, if you think that you're going from, you can look through the first end to find the, the right place for the first item. And then you can start at the second, but okay, so you maybe put that one up at the top. You want to find the smallest item and put it up at the top and then the next smallest item and put it in position two and then three. So you're basically counting n plus n plus one, n minus one plus n minus two, n minus three. And that ends up being n squared plus n over two, I think. So as I'm talking, it's n squared. If you're going to double it, it's going to be n squared. Um, and then matrix multiplication is um, n cubed, and then lots of things that end up being brute force. You have to look through all the possible combinations. They're either two to the n, or it's n factorial time. Um, now, my computer science professors would kill me if they saw this, but you know, in actual fact, like those numbers aren't going to get big. We saw that for two to the sixty-fourth power, which is eighteen quintillion, it's only sixty-four. So it's only going to run 60, 64 times slower, which is it's not peanuts, but it's not doubling the time or tripling the time when you've got a huge amount of space. So um, it's effectively constant time, but it's not really constant time because you're never going to have 16 quintillion elements anyway. Um, so very quick introduction to uh, big O notation. So let's move on to, to the next topic. Any other questions with this? Let's move on to modulus arithmetic. Um, so what is this good for? Um, so, okay, who's, who's ever used, maybe, who's used, who's used the mod operator in Perl? Right, who's, who's never used it? Who has no idea even what it's good for? Okay, so a few people are, a few people are honest about it at any rate. Um, what, what, what have you used it for? The people who raise your hand, sure. Uh, okay, that's good. That was one of my examples. What? I used it with cartography. Cartography? Very cool. Um, I use it for doing something every n, you know, I've, I've got a counter. I, I mod it, and when I hit zero, I do a... See, you guys already know, you already know this, so I'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, I was going to say that these were my examples, date calculation, round robin, and cryptography. The cryptography thing is is interesting, so maybe we'll, we'll skip ahead to that. Um, um, this is like a quick review of how it works. So um, the modulo operator, it gives you the remainder. If you do a division, um, so there, 5 mod 2 equals 1, because when you divide 5 by 2, the answer is 2 with a remainder of 1, if you remember how doing long division long, long time ago. Um, but if you take 9 mod 3, that's 0, because it divides evenly, so there's no there's no remainder at all. So, like one quick check is you want to see whether nine is divisible by three. You can just do mod, and if you get zero, that means it's divisible. So, uh, um, so I had some syntax things. Um, usually, often in lots of languages, it's a percent sign. Sometimes it's a um, it's a function. Um, in COBOL, it's divide x by uh, by y, um, giving z remainder m. Although I think I looked up and they have a mod function now. So. Maybe I'm being um, I'm being overly mean to COBOL. Um, um, so some uses, um, 
You can test whether things are odd or even. You can do time calculations, as we said before. Um, you can, um, what was I doing here? Um, you can do things that are cyclic because if you take, if you do things mod, mod, like say mod five here, the number of values are always going to be zero, one, two, three, four, and then it's going to loop back to zero, one, two, three, four. So it's good if you're filling things into an array and you always want to go back. To, you want to have something that's like a cyclical, cyclical array, circular array. I don't know what I'm saying. Um, to go back to zero again, it's really easy if you just use mod to do that. Um, so round robin, you can do that. Um, I know someone's got to talk on FizzBuzz tomorrow. Um, I'm sorry. You don't have to go to the talk now because this is how you do it in Perl. <laughs> um, Can I get a note? What? Can I get a note? I don't have to do the presentation. Yeah, you don't have to do the presentation anymore. This is one of the things I converted from Python uh, yesterday. Um, this is some, a, another um, Project Euler problem. They wanted to find uh, the last 10 digits of this number. So it's 28433 times two to the whatever that is. This number, this is a this is a, a prime number. It's not a Mersenne prime, it's a non-Mersenne prime. It has 2,357,207 digits. And um, they want to know what the last 10 digits of this is. So I did this in Python because Python automatically converts things to big int, so it was just easier to do it that way. Um, so this is the first way I tried to do it. Um, right, so it's very straightforward. I did this in a really dumb way because I knew that you could do this and get the answer, it might take a long time. And then just for the heck of it, I did it the second way too. Um, the first way took two minutes, which is actually pretty quick considering it's, it's, two, it's like 2.3 million digits, right? Um, but the second time, it ran in 0.155 seconds. And the reason is that it's there's a trick to doing um, um, to find do a modulus operation on exponents that is much faster than trying to do it. Well, the way I did it, where I computed the big number and then took mod of it, I did it all in one operation. Python apparently is smart enough to see that I'm doing it and do it the fa the smart way and not the dumb brute force way of doing it. Um, I didn't even try to do this in Perl because I had no way, I doubt that the big int. Um, um, module would support that. Maybe it does. Um, yeah, and the reason the reason that this is important is because this sort of calculation comes up. Maybe not for this particular thing, but you end up doing taking mod of exponents in cryptography a lot. So, which is why this is why. So, if you want to know more about this, look up the Wikipedia article on modular exponentiation. So. Okay, so we're all like reviewing things from high school math, basically here. Um, trigonometry. Um, so, what's tri what's trig good for as a, as a programmer? What's it, what's what are some uses for it? As the things that I've used it for are cycles and animation. So, just review. Um, this is um, a right triangle. We have our angle theta, and we have the um, a, which is the opposite um, edge, and we have b, which is the adjacent edge. Um, so remember, a, a squared plus b squared equals uh, h squared, right? So um, we have this, um, right? So sine is the um, the ratio of the adjacent side, the length of the adjacent side to the hypotenuse. That's a sine. Uh, the cosine is the ratio of the adjacent. Uh, so I'm sorry. Sine is the opposite side to the hypotenuse. The cosine is the adjacent side to the hypotenuse, and then tangent is is uh, opposite to adjacent. Uh, and you remember this, I, I learned this in high school, Sokotoa is a way to remember this. Sine opposite adjacent, cosine, um, sine opposite hypotenuse, cosine adjacent hypotenuse. I'm oh, sorry, I hit the wrong arrow there, we'll go. And then um, tangent opposite adjacent. All right, um, we're usually, we usually think of degrees as being um, something between zero and 360, um, but computers are generally want them in radians and there's two pi radians in 360 degrees. So this is how you can do convert. So they, all, oh, they basically want them in radians because that's how all the algorithms work. Just like the, tail, the Taylor sequence um, expansions for sine and cosine want radians. Um, so just remember, this is what a sine curve looks like. It starts at zero, goes up to one at, at pi over two, <laughs> then it goes down, it hits minus one at three pi over two, and then it comes back and is zero again at two pi. Um, 
And this is what cosine looks like. It starts at one instead of zero, so it's kind of out of phase um, with sine. We've all seen pictures like this. Um, um, this is what it looks like on a, on a unit circle. Um, this is another way of visualizing it. Um, you can kind of see that the cosine, but you can, one way you can actually draw circles with sines and cosines just by increasing the angle and taking the point, if you think of, of X as being the cosine of the angle and Y as being the sine of the angle and just increment theta a little bit at a time, you can draw a circle that way. Um, so you might ask yourself, why does it go to two pi? Like why, why does everything go to two pi instead of like pi? Why is, why is it all based on that? Well, it turns out that, um, um, you know, two pi does come up all the time. Why don't, so some people have proposed, including David Hand here, that like just, um, it should just be tau. Like, so these, if you make this new variable called tau, call that two pi, then all the formulas end up being a lot easier. Um, but, you know, I think we're stuck. We're stuck with pi. It's been around since it's been around for twenty five hundred years or so. It's probably we're probably stuck with this. Um, I'm oh, sorry. Well, tau is literally twice the size of pi. So um, we just did. We all celebrate tau day last month. You missed tau day. You missed tau day. It's June twenty eighth. Um, so. Okay, so another another thing that 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 sines and cosines are good for is to do some animations like this. So you see how it's kind of it's a little hard to see in this animation because it looks like it's going at the constant speed all the time. It's actually slowing down a little bit at the bottom and then reversing and going up to the top and then reversing and going down to the bottom. Say so this is this is a Python program too. I just found on the internet to sort of illustrate it. Um, the um, the key parts of it are can I. Can I move the mouse pointer? Oh, that's not going to show up. So um, what it's doing is it's just, it's doing some initialization oh. things. And then, sorry, if you don't talk into the mic. Oh, I, I, that's a good point. So I will stay here. Um, so it's basically set, starts a step at zero. And then at the bottom, it's incrementing the step by 0 0.2 each time. And then what it's doing is it's taking the Y position um, by the sign of the step. And then it's the amplitude is just some number to make it be something between zero and one, between the bottom and the top, whatever it's going to be. Um, so you think of sine is just going to go between, it's going to go between minus one and one, and it's going to smooth out just like that curve, and then it's going to go in the opposite direction to the minus one, and then go back up again, and then you multiply it by something which is going to scale it to whatever the size of the box is, then you get this nice smooth animation that just goes up and down and up and down. So. There you go. It's useful for things that you want, just like you could use mod for things that are going to be go to some number and then you want to have to go back to zero. Sines and cosines are good to animate things or, or simulate things that are going to go to some value and then reverse direction and go back to some lower value and then go back up again. All right. So. That's right. Okay. So. Final topic is, just as the fans turn on, um, vectors and linear algebra. So what are they good for? They're good for lots of things, obviously. The, the examples I'm gonna talk about are computer graphics and machine learning for these. So what is a vector? So a vector is something that's got length and it's got direction. So um, we have, that's our vector A there and it's going from A like capital A to capital B. Um, often they get shown on graphs like this. So this is another way of thinking of it is that you can think of it as being the point um, where X equals two and Y equals three. Um, and the direction is you started at zero. So you think of it starting at zero and going up to that point that gives it a natural direction. So you can think of those as being arrows in space or you can think of them as being points on the plane. And it's, it's all the same thing really. Um, they can be represented in lots of different ways. Um, you can think of them as just a, a tuple. In this case, it's, a, it's, a, you know, it's just X and Y values. You can think of them as rays. Um, sometimes they're, they're shown as column vectors or row vectors. Column just, vector just means it's, it's vertical and row vectors means it's horizontal. And that has to do with the, working out the math sometimes. Um, um, so sometimes they're drawn each way. Um, 
uh, so you get the length of the vector um, that's denoted by putting two lines, two cl lines close to each other on each side of the variable. So, um, and that's computed with the Euclidean distance formula, which is this. Um, so you take all the elements of it, you square them, add them up, and then take the square root of that. So um, we've seen that in two dimensions. That's how you compute you know, any kind of distance. Um, you know, this is that, that thing I showed for the, um, you wonder how long the hypotenuse of a right triangle is, you take the square of the x direction and the square of the y, direct, the y length, and then you take the square root of that. Um, and that works, that works in n dimensions as well. Um, um, lots of times we want to have unit vectors. Unit vectors just mean that the length is one and you can normalize anything, any vector by dividing it by its length, just like that. Um, or you're dividing all the elements of it by its length. Um, okay. Um, dot products are also really important. Um, the dot product, some people call it the inner product of two vectors. Um, so if you think of, uh, they have to be the same size. So you have A is an n-dimensional vector, A1, A2, A3, up to An. B is also an n-dimensional vector, B1, 2, 3, 4, up to N. Um, and then that's um, a lot of math there. It just really means that for each pair of them, you add up, you, you multiply the first one in A by the first one in B, and then the, the second one in A, and the second one in B, and so on and so on. You add them all up, and then that's your dot product. Um, so you think you think of that as being a loop. So that's just, you know, it's a math terminology for something being a loop. So if you want to take the dot product of one, two, um, dot to three, four, it's one times three. So the first one in the first one and the one and then three, and then the second one and the second one. So it's one times three plus two times four is three plus eight and 11. So the dot product of one, two and three, four is 11. Uh, and so another way of thinking of the length of, of a vector is just the dot product of it with itself. Um, the dot product is also interesting, it's also useful as a similarity measure um, it's because the, um, the dot product is kind of the cosine of that angle between the two vectors. Um, so you think of, of um, if one vector there was basically was if one vector was going from zero to where two pi is, and the other vector is is the hypotenuse there, then the dot product of those two is going to be the cosine of theta, which is going out there. Um, so if they were the same vector, they would the dot product would be one, and they would be identical. If they if yeah, and so this it's not quite one; it's probably about what half or so so there. Um, it's really useful. It's used a lot in um, machine learning. If you have two vectors, you want to see how similar they are. It's super simple to compute to do this too. Um, all right, um, run okay, maybe. Okay, so we're gonna move on to the last topic here, which is matrices. Um, so we all know what matrices are, right? This is the matrix, right? Um, uh, well, in, in math, this is, this is a matrix. A matrix is like a two-dimensional um, collection of, of vectors, really. Um, so instead of vectors are just a one-dimensional thing, to, um, matrices are two-dimensional things. Um, and we think of them generally as having M, M rows and N columns, which is what's going on here. Um, so this is one of the cases where what I learned in as an undergrad math major didn't map very well to what ended up, I think, being practical in um, my grad computer science courses. Because this is this is what I, I we spent most of our time learning about um, in linear algebra as an undergrad. So we learned how to do row reduction. Row reduction is if you have m equa if you have n equations and n unknowns, you can use this. You can go through this technique called row reduction to figure out what the, all the values of all the variables should be. Um, Computers could do that really easily now. So like we spent lots of time doing that by hand. It's super tedious, um, don't wanna do that. We learned a lot about adding, subtracting, in particular, multiplying matrices. Multiplying them also is super tedious because you have to do all these different, you have to do n cubed um, um, multiplications in order to do this. We learned how to, multi how to invert them. We learned about computing determinants and then eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which are actually super useful, which I'll get to at the very end here. Um, Again, this is, we spent a lot of time on things where you think were not, which were, which you had to be, had to learn how to compute if you were going to do this by hand, but computers can do this all a lot easier, 
more easily now. Um, the main thing I learned about matrices in grad school is this. Um, you can think of an M, an N by N matrix as being a function that takes in a vector as input and it returns another vector as output. If you think of them as functions that transform one vector into another vector, it makes everything else about linear algebra be, make a lot more sense. Um, so what, is, what do I mean by that? So suppose we have a, a matrix A, um, which is two by two, and we have some vector V, which has two elements in it. Um, so this is how you multiply A times V. So major multiplication, you have two big matrices, it's kind of complicated, but if, if you, if you are just taking a single vector, it's pretty straightforward. You're just doing a bunch of dot products. It's, it's two dot products. It's a dot product for the, the first one, a dot product for the second one. And so the, the output here is really, I mean, it doesn't look like it, but the output is, so V is, a, v is a, a vector, and then the output, that thing, even though it's got additions in it, it's just another vector. It's, it's got two, two scalar values in it. Um, and then once you, once you have that, then you can chain those all together. So if you have, Two, if you have two vectors, um, u and v, and then u, you can put them side by. You can put them one column and then the next column, and then the thing on the on the the left in the in the result is the thing that's up top in the in the second row up there. Um, that's a v, and then the thing that's on the on the right hand side is a u. So you can think of them as being independent things that are happening there. So it's just basically applying that A function first to U and then to V. And I hope I, first to V and then to U. First to V and then to U. Um, this is important for, this gets used all the time in computer graphics because lots of times these matrices are doing different kinds of transformations and you can apply them to all the points in say some figure in your, in your, you know, that you have in your graphics. If you want to spin something around, you want to move it, you want to stretch it, you want to shrink it. You do this all by taking all the points in them, making a big, long, um, like horizontal matrix with all the points in it and applying the one matrix to it and do the big multiplication and have that all happen. So, um, so there is things called, called transformation matrices. There's lots of matrices, you can do different things. Um, if you want to stretch a matrix by K um, in the, in the, X axis, you can do what's, what I have on the left. So it's just the matrix K001 times K. So that's going to give you the result KX over Y. So it's making, it's increasing, it's multiplying X by K, but it's leaving Y alone. Um, and similarly, for if you want to do the Y axis, just put the K in the lower right hand corner, and all you're doing is multiplying Y and keeping X by itself. Um, this is harder to see, but you can also rotate things um, around the, um, if you think of this being a point on the XY plane at zero, you can multiply, you can rotate it around the um, zero, zero with these two things, either clockwise or counterclockwise. And you just have to take my word that those are actually what, what happens there. Um, so if you had a point, um, you know, again, X and Y, and you want to you move it counterclockwise by theta, you would, up, you would multiply it by those, that matrix on the left at the bottom. Um, okay, so here's another example where we're, we're shearing it. So instead of, instead of having it be, this, what happens if you put that, that thing that you want to move it by in the you know, position one, two, instead of one, one? Um, now what happens is you're adding some value to it and you're basically keeping Y the same, but in X you're sliding everything over. And you can, in fact, you're increasing it as you go higher up towards the top of Mona Lisa, you're moving everything further over and further over. Um, and um, so if you start with Mona Lisa there on the left, what you end up with is something where everything kind of gets shoved, gets pushed over to the right as you go up to the top. And even that's, that Mona Lisa is just kind of illustrating what's going on here. In actuality, these would maybe be pixels in an image. Um, so they wouldn't be multicolored like they are here, but it's the same idea where what you would have there, what you would pass into that matrix is all the pixels in, in the picture that make up Mona Lisa make them all, even if they're just X, X, Y, X, Y, X, Y, X, Y, make a big, long horizontal vector, multiply them, multiply that horizontal shear matrix by that. And then the result of that is going to be everything pushed over like that. So 
That's why I said you can think of these matrices as being functions that are transforming one set of vectors into another set of vectors. So everyone following this is kind of like a deep thing. So kind of you go, once you start playing around with it, it's like, oh, that's what's going on here. Um, all right, so um, no, we're doing a time, I have about 10 minutes. Wait. Okay, so this is the last topic. Um, so let's say we have this matrix, um, two, one, one, two. Um, and then let's multiply a bunch of vectors by it. So um, if we multiply that matrix by one, the vector one, one, we get three, three back. Okay. Um, and if we multiply by one, two, we get four, five back. And I'm just going to go through a whole bunch of examples here. Ah, okay. There we go. Okay, so now let's just notice something here. Um, so these ones that I just made kind of purple and probably impossible to read from the back. Um, notice that for those, what it's really doing is, for the other ones, it's kind of, for those, if you pass in one minus one, you get one minus one back. If you pass in two minus two, you get two minus two back. If you pass in minus two, you basically get the same thing back that you passed in, right? You see that? And it's not happening for those other ones. It's only happening for the three that I highlighted, okay? Um, okay, now look at these ones that are in blue. For these, what's happening is that the, everything, the values that you pass in are getting multiplied by three. Okay, everyone see that? And the other ones, it's not happening. It's only for the ones that are in, in red, you get the same value back. And for the ones that are in blue, it's, it's everything's getting multiplied by three. The X and the Y are getting multiplied by three. Um, and the rest of them, some, something random is happening. Okay, everyone see that? Um, okay, so those, those values that it's getting, that they're getting multiplied by are called the eigenvalues of the matrix two, one, one, two. Um, and then the, um, the vectors that are associated with them, in which case they're, they're gonna be the small ones there. So the, the one for red is gonna be one minus one and the one for blue is gonna be one, one. Those are the associated eigen vectors for it. So eigen comes from the German word being, meaning own, W, or sorry, O-W-N, but probably a better English translation is characteristic. So those are like the characteristic um, vectors describing what that matrix is doing. So they're kind of describing how, how it's transforming the one space to the other space. So um, it's things, some things are getting, um, in one direction it's getting expanded by three, another, it, um, so, right. So some things are getting expanded by three, other things are getting expanded on. So I have an example here. Um, so, okay, so if you look at that, that animation, it's gonna go back and forth um, in a loop. Notice that the, the, the things that are in blue, those arrows, they're changing their, their dimension, they're getting bigger, but they're not really changing the direction that they're pointing. The, the kind of pinkish ones, they're also staying in the same direction, but they're, they're kind of moving around. But the ones that are in red, they're getting skewed in various directions. And in fact, they're getting skewed by one in the, they're getting skewed three times as much in the Y direction than they are in the X direction. Uh, so that matrix is really mapping one n dimensional space to the other one. And this is a way of kind of visualizing the way that it's, it's changing it. Um, so you see that some, some of those vectors are changing the length, but not the direction. And they're the eigenvectors of the matrix. So one minus one and one, one. Um, and the amount that they change are the eigenvectors. These are super important in linear algebra, machine learning, all kinds of stuff, because they're a way of trying to understand what's going on here. Oftentimes in machine learning, you're not gonna have just two elements. You're gonna have a hundred or a thousand things in the matrix, and you still want to know what, what is going on with this? What are the important things? Most of the, t oftentimes, just a few of those, the eigenvectors are gonna be really big and most of them kind of be relatively small. So it's a way of reducing the dimensionality of the matrix and things. So I don't know, this is, I understand I'm speeding through what's going on here, but I just wanted to give people at least a sense of what an eigenvector eigenvalues matrices are. Um, so, um, 
More information. Um, Wikipedia has good references for lots of things. Um, I like this description of what eigenvectors are that I have here. Um, and then the example with the bouncing ball is from inventwithpython.com. Um, they have an example using trigonometry to animate bounces. Um, um, yeah, so that's it. Anyone have any questions? Probably have people have lots of questions. Or maybe I'm just like, I know it's a lot to take in on a Friday when we've all probably been out and eaten tons of Chinese food for lunch. Um, it's Tuesday, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is Tuesday. Even you're struggling. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't fall asleep. That's a good you didn't fall asleep, so that's good. Um, we have five minutes, I guess, five more minutes for questions. So anyone have any questions or are you just totally, yes. I'm sorry. Um, I don't think they are, but I can put them online. Yeah, this may be the last time I'm giving it. So, um, yes. You could have used uh, Raku to do your Python <laughs> I, I could, does, does, does Raku do, go to begins automatically without having to? It does, but it doesn't know that, uh, that trick. Doesn't know that trick, there you go. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, that's something. That's something to add. Something to add to Raku. Uh, oh, so you have to know. You have to know to do it, but it's got a function to do it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Yes. Is it okay if I start telling people I have a math degree of the stuff? Absolutely. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, yeah, you get another question. Where do you do your Where do you do your exercises so that you keep fresh on this? Um. Hmm. Well, I mean, you know, I, I work as a as a researcher in you know in a radiology lab where we're doing where where the things like principal component analysis come up at meetings all the time. I think he was maybe asking where. Oh, you can do it I, I thought he was asking where I was doing it. Yeah. Um, where does one? <laughs> where does one uh, stay fresh? Where do you do it? I don't. Re I honestly don't remember because I added this. I added this. I think the last time I gave it a few months ago. I found one really good source that explained what eigenvectors and eigenvalues were because I honestly never understood them myself. And then once I understood it, basically to the way I just described them as their, um, like the characteristic, um, like their their the way that they transform some set of vectors to another. It kind of. It made everything else make a lot more sense because I was reading lots of so things like eigen X come up all the time, and there's eigen um, oh, there's eigen genes in you know First and second yeah. right. Um, there's eigen genes in genetic research. There's eigen faces in computer vision research. Like you, at some point, someone doing research on something is going to put the word eigen in front of it. Um, so I think I, I just needed to learn how that worked in order to understand classes and papers I was reading um, in grad school. Um, for the, the computer graphics stuff, some of it I kind of picked up because I took some computer graphics classes and then I realized, oh, this thing is, um, you know, I oh, if I make this be a sign, then it'll go this far and then it'll start coming back down. Um, um, Stuff with mod, I took a um, number theory course that is an undergrad, and we spent a lot of time talking about mod and proving things that are groups under modular arithmetic and things like that. So it just kind of got stuck in my brain uh, then. Um, um, I don't know. I do advent of code problem every year. And sometimes these things, these sorts of things come up for one of the problems or some of the problems. So it kind of keeps me, keeps me fresh for that. Um, every once in a while I get bored. Maybe I've run out of, of um, advent of code problems and maybe I'm between jobs and looking for something to do. And I start wading into project Euler problems, which, you know, 
have these interesting things to mo with mods sometimes or logarithms sometimes. Um, so she's telling me I'm done, but. Uh, just Keynote for on, on the Mac. Keynote, Keynote. It's part of it's Apple's free. It, it's it comes with Mac OS software. It's called Keynote. Yeah, I have a Mac, and it's 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 Apple's presentation software. Yeah, it's nothing nothing fancy. It does have oh, the math. Oh, a few releases ago, they added the ability to insert equations. So um, you enter them as as LaTeX, and they come out the way I was showing them. Um, you can do that in you do that in um, PowerPoint too. PowerPoint lets you insert equations. <laughs> you used to have to use something. The, the, the way to do it before was there was um, a program called LaTeXit or LaTeXit, which would you could enter LaTeX code and it would give you this um, um, little snippet of of like a PDF image that you could insert into your slides and then you could you could do it. This is better because they're actual objects like uh, Keynote knows what they are so you can move them around a lot more easily and they inter they interact with everything else better. Um, anyone else, if you have any other questions, I'll be at the, the social thing, whenever that is. So I think we're, I think we're done. So thank you all for coming to the talk. <laughs>